Good evening, and welcome to the first of our midweek Lenten series, Encounters with Christ. Tonight's topic, Jesus and the Man Born Blind. We're so happy to have you with us. Please stand as we begin the liturgy. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening. And the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness. Shine within your people here. Joyous light of heavenly glory, loving glow of God's own face, you who sing creation story, shine on every land and race. songs to you, God of daybreak, God of shadows, come and light our hearts anew. In the stars that grace the darkness, in the blazing sun of dawn, in the light of peace and wisdom, we can hear your quiet song. Love that fills the night with wonder, love that warms the weary soul, love that bursts all chains asunder, set us free and make us whole. You who made the heavens splendor, every dancing star of night, make us shine with gentle justice, let us each reflect your light. Mighty God of all creation, gentle Christ who lights our way, loving spirit of salvation, lead us on to endless day. May God be with you all. And also with you. Let us sing our thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Blessed are you, creator of the universe. From old you have led your people by night and day. May the light of your Christ make our darkness bright. For your word and your presence are the light of our pathways. And you are the light and life of all creation. seated. sin and disgrace. Keep me sheltered by your grace, for I trust that your promise is true. Oh, set my feet on pathways of peace, and teach me to 
to walk in your ways. Let your truth be my light, my salvation shining bright. I will serve you the length of my days. Remember, God, your mercy and love. Forgive me for times when I fall. For your mercy is great to the humble ones who wait. To the lowly who answer love's call. The path of God is love without end to pilgrims who walk in God's ways. Teach our hearts, make us wise, for to you we turn our eyes. We will serve you the length of our days. O God of grace and mercy, you are the refuge of all who seek you. You are the shelter of all who wait in hope for you. Set our feet firmly on your pathway and guide us by the light of your truth so that we might faithfully follow you all the days of our lives. We ask this through Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the ninth chapter. Glory, Glory to, to you, you, O Lord. Lord. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go now, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it's someone like him. And he kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Did that grace appear? The 
hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me, his word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first be Good evening and welcome to this evening's worship. Those of you who are here in person and those of you as well online gathered with us this night. Uh, we begin as Pastor Denny shared with our Lenten midweek series theme, Encounters with, with Jesus. And we're going to be taking a look at, at the various people that m Jesus met on his way to Jerusalem, on his way to the cross. And, and we will be taking a look this evening at Jesus meeting the man who was born blind. Now grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, the risen Christ. Amen. Kids learn things in interesting ways, don't you think? Think back to when you are a kid. How did you learn things? Well, I think we probably learn things by experience. By experience. For example, when I was a youngster, and by youngster I mean I was four or five, about the time I was getting ready to go into kindergarten, we had a cat come through the neighborhood, a stray cat, and, and mom put a bowl of milk out on the back porch, and you know with stray cats, once you do that, it, the, the cat now belongs to you, right? So I thought that was a pretty cool thing, so I one day went out and grabbed the cat and thought, you know, cats seem to always land on their feet, I'd heard that someplace, so I got up on, climbed up on top of the picnic table in our backyard, and I got a bucket of water, and I proceeded to drop the cat as high as I could get him from the top of the picnic table down into this bucket of water. Then I jumped down real quick, and the cat was not sure what had happened yet, so I grabbed the cat before he had jumped out of the bucket. I did this three or four times before the cat just ran away. We never saw him again. I, I went into the house crying, Mommy, the cat ran away. What do you mean the cat ran away? What, what's that bucket of water doing out there? So no wonder the cat ran away. So lesson number one, cats don't like water much. And so when I got to kindergarten and somebody mentioned the cats don't like water, I said, yeah, I know that because I did it. I did it once. I know they don't like water. Probably didn't like being dropped from a height either, but that's another, that's another piece to it. How about this? I discovered in elementary school that school lunches stick to walls, although not all of them, not all of them. I mean, hot dogs tend to bounce off walls. Hamburgers just kind of, you know, they make kind of a splatter mark. But if you get the right kind of macaroni and cheese, it sticks to the wall. You generally have to use Velveeta cheese, though. The thicker cheese, that's not even cheese, whatever it is. It sticks to the wall much better. Ice cream works, mashed potatoes, but I learned about what kinds of food stick to the wall. How do kids learn these things and many, many others that we could list? Experience. Experience. Great truths that we discover along the way. The point for tonight, one of the points for tonight is this. A dramatical, personal, eye-opening experience can give us new insight and new perception, new vision. 
And on a much deeper level, a much more profound level, a much more positive level, that's precisely what's going on in our story this evening, this amazing story in John chapter 9. A man blind from birth has a dramatic eye-opening experience with Jesus. Talk about new vision. Talk about new insight. He's completely and totally healed. He's made whole, and he comes back from the pool of Siloam with 20-20 vision, able to see perfectly for the first time in his life. And his transformation is so dramatic and so perfect, if you will, that even the folks who saw him every day didn't all recognize him. I think that's the guy who was blind. Oh, I, it looks like him, but I, there's, no, there's just something different about him. And the formerly blind man says, no, I, it's me. It's me, all right. I'm the man. What I want to do this evening is take a look at this encounter with Jesus, this experience that changed everything. Well, one day as Jesus and his disciples are walking along together, they see this pathetic, pitiful sight, a man who's been blind from birth. And the disciples are watching him kind of groveling around on his hands and knees, begging for, for whatever he can get there in the gutter. And this, this sightless one with dead eyes makes a sad, haunting picture. As he crouches there and he feels around for, in the dirt for scraps of, of garbage that he can maybe even eat, and wards off with his hands those who are trampling around him, the crowd heading into work or away from work. He's eating their dust and pleading without, without much success for their help and assistance. And intrigued by this pathetic sight, the disciples ask Jesus a theological question. Lord, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. Was it his fault? Or did someone in his family do something wrong to cause this? That's a pretty uh, important theological point that's made here. The religious leaders of Jesus' day taught that if people were lame or blind, crippled, whatever, whatever they had going on, they had it coming. That either they had sinned or someone, their parents had sinned or another family member had sinned. And so that's why they were in this place. Makes it easier to walk by and not do anything, right? Well, it's their fault anyway. It's their fault anyway. This is God's judgment on them for their wrongdoings. And that's what, that's what the people were taught by the religious leaders the consequences of their sin as wicked people, and so they were shunned. But Jesus didn't see them or this blind man, certainly as sinners or as wicked people. He saw them as children of God and as persons of integrity and worth. And so he healed them. So Jesus says to the disciples, that's not the way it works. When else has he said that? Anybody remember from, from, the, uh, from the New Testament when he's, he said, this man's not born blind because of his sinfulness, but because God's got something big in store he wants to show you. Lazarus, right? Remember in terms of waiting to go back to Lazarus? Also remember the time when the, when the tower fell on the people and the disciples said to then who sinned that they were caught up in that tragedy? And he said, that's not the way God works. So here in John chapter 9, Jesus goes over to the blind man to help him. And, and notice that when the disciples see the blind man, they see something to discuss, whereas Jesus sees something that needs to be done. Something that needs to be done. The disciples want to debate the truth philosophically while the guy's groveling around in the dirt. And Jesus wants to do something about it. The point is this, it's not enough just to talk about it. What pleases God is when we do something about it. And that's what the Lord's trying to teach the disciples here and us as well. So he, he spits on the ground, makes this, this uh, spittle or whatever, then he anoints the man's eyes with the clay. Now that seems repulsive to you. Actually, saliva was, was considered to be 
a healing salve in the day and in history, a remedy, if you will. And ancient people really believe strongly in its powers. In a sense, we still do. <laughs> uh, last time I burnt my finger, I think the first thing I did was stick it in my mouth. You know, ugh, that kind of thing. So Jesus anoints the man's eyes with the clay. Now, the single most important word in this whole passage is this word anoints. The word, the Greek original used, used here for anoints, is the same word that's used for Christ. You've heard me say it before, Jesus Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It was a term of, of description, the anointed one, God's anointed one. And it's the same word that, that Jesus uses and that, and that John uses to describe what he does for this man. Anoints his eyes. Anoints his eyes. And isn't that beautiful when you think about it that way? Let me ask you, would you like to have your eyes anointed? Have they ever been anointed? Some of you are going, oh, I haven't thought of it that way, maybe. After the anointing of the man's eyes with the clay, Jesus sends him to wash in the pool of Siloam. Man goes, washes away the clay, and comes back seeing. And the neighbors are amazed. They can't believe it. They ask him how it happened, and he says, The man called Jesus healed me. He gave me my sight. And there's great joy and celebration in the city. And they all live happily ever after. Not so fast. Not so fast, not quite. The Pharisees, it's always the Pharisees, they're always throwing, throwing some, a fly in the ointment. Oh, get that in there? That, anyway, that just struck me. The Pharisees, the watchdogs of religion, watchdogs of religion, they get wind of it and they come out and they're fuming, upset about the whole thing because they're suspicious about anything and everything Jesus does. But they, the fact is, Jesus also did this when? Did you catch it? on the Sabbath. So that, first of all, is one reason to say Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about because he obviously did this on the Sabbath. They can't, they can't celebrate the fact that a man has been born blind can now see. No, it happened on the Sabbath, and we can't have that. We can't have that. In essence, they're blind at this point, right? So they come out with fervor and zeal, and they're going to investigate. And we've just got half the story that we read here a few mo moments ago in, in our gospel lesson. But it goes on to the Pharisees interrogating the healed man's parents. And they scare the man's parents out of their wits. You remember? So is this your son? Yes, it's our son. Was he born blind? Yes, he was born blind. How was he healed? I don't know. You're going to have to ask him. Well, we're not sure of that. Well, yeah, you'll have to ask him because he's of age. And the text tells us they were afraid because the Pharisees had said if anybody was caught worshiping Jesus or following Jesus, they'd be tossed out of the synagogue. That's a big deal. That was their whole social life. It would be like being a leper and cast out in the back alley someplace. And so the parents were afraid. So they said, you ask him, he's of age. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. Thanks for your support in all of this. So they go back to the young man and they say, what's, what's going on here? And the young man says, well, I'm, I don't know what to tell you. One thing I know, once I was blind and now I see. Any other questions? Any other questions? I don't know about your rules and regulations. Actually, I do, but it doesn't matter in this case. I, all I knew is I, I was blind from the time I was born, and now I can see you and everybody and everything around me. By the way, do you want to follow Jesus too? Is that why you're asking me? Kid had some chutzpah. So the Pharisees are defeated by the argument, and they know it. So they do what Oftentimes, what people do when they feel insecure, have no moral power, they turn to force. Kind of like what we're seeing on the news every night. Right? They kick him out, they cast him out of the synagogue, which was a big deal. They push him out. 
And this sets the stage for one of the most beautiful moments in all of Scripture. Jesus hears about it, hears that this young man's been thrown out of the synagogue, and Jesus comes looking for him. Isn't that awesome? Jesus goes looking for him. The disciples are saying, well, let's move on. That was a pretty cool miracle. Uh, Really interesting conversation with the Pharisees. Now, next town, and Jesus goes, no, 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 no. I'm going to find this guy. He and I need to have a conversation. Isn't that awesome? Jesus comes to help. It's when we're in trouble, Jesus comes to help. It's when we're not in trouble, Jesus comes to help. And when they come face to face, when he comes face to face with Jesus, Jesus says to the, to the young man, do you believe in the Son of God? And the healed man says, who is he sh- that I should believe in him? And Jesus says, you're looking at him, tiger. And the young man says, I believe. And he worships him. Isn't it a great story? I mean, it really is a wonderful moment. It's packed with the stuff of life. There's so much here. There's blindness and sight. There's sickness and healing. There's prejudice and love, fear and faith. Rejection, acceptance, defeat, and victory. But there's one question that explodes out of this gospel story and addresses itself directly and personally to you and me. Namely this, have our eyes been anointed? Have our eyes been anointed? Can we see with the vision of our Lord? Have our eyes been anointed with the Spirit of Christ? Let me break it down a minute, for a minute here, and be a little bit more specific. First of all, when, when our eyes have been anointed, it changes the way we see ourselves. It changes the way we see ourselves. You know, we were all born blind. We were all born blind. Babies are born blind, not physically necessarily, although I don't think they can see very well, but they're not blind. Don't misunderstand me. Babies are wonderful. Little babies are fantastic. They represent God's greatest miracle, the miracle of birth, and they affirm God's understanding that life should go on. But the truth is that babies are born blinded by selfishness. Right? They're born blinded by selfishness. They see every person as someone who exists solely for their benefit and comfort. At least my three were like that. Maybe yours weren't. My three were just like that. That's the way babies are, right? They they come into the world screaming, do something for me, feed me, love me, change me, burp me, rock me. Not necessarily in that order, but that's what they do. Throughout infancy and childhood, if nothing happens to alter them, sometimes into the teen years too, and even sometimes into adulthood for a few, it's me, 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 take care of me, do for me, cater to me, please me, give to me, pamper me. But then Jesus brings us up short because time and again in the Gospels, he makes it very clear that one of the things that blinds us most is selfishness, and the only cure is to have our eyes anointed anointed bishop kenneth shamblin who's a methodist bishop once said conversion is moving from that belongs to me to i belong to that that's what it means to have our eyes anointed to move from selfish vision to service vision to move from do something for me to let me do and be for the Lord and his people. So have our eyes been anointed? Can we see beyond ourselves? Second thing is this. When our eyes have been anointed, it changes the way we see other people. Other people. One of my favorite all-time true stories uh, is the story I'm about to share, and I've shared it before. You've, you've heard it before in different contexts. But I think it's just a, a great story. Maybe you'll agree, maybe not. But Tim Brewster tells this story. I have no idea who Tim Brewster is, just that Tim Brewster is Tim Brewster, and he tells a powerful story about a mom who took her kids to a crowded restaurant one day. Her six-year-old son asked if he could say grace. 
He said, absolutely. So he prayed. This was his prayer. Ready? God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for the food. And God, I would thank you even more if mom gets us ice cream for dessert and liberty and justice for all. Amen. Along with the laughter from the other customers, because he was kind of saying it pretty loud, loudly, the woman at the very next table kind of furrowed her brow and, and growled loudly. Well, you know what? That's what's wrong with this country. Kids today don't even know how to pray. The very idea, asking God for ice cream. Why, I never. And hearing this, the little six-year-old boy just burst into tears. And he asked his mom, did I do wrong? Did I, did I do wrong? I'm so sorry. Is God mad at me? Is God mad at me now? And the boy's mother pulled him over into her lap. She hugged him tightly, assured him that he had done a terrific job with his prayer, and God was certainly not mad at him. Just then, an elderly gentleman walked over to the table. He winked at the little boy and said, Son, I know God really, really well. God and I talk all the time, every single day. And I happen to know for a fact that God loved your prayer. He loved your prayer. In fact, it may have been the best one he's heard all day. Really? Really? The little boy asked. Cross my heart said the man and then he whispered he leaned over and whispered into the little boy's ear pointing at the woman at the next table who had made that remark that started the whole thing and he said too bad she never asks God for ice cream because a little ice cream is good for the soul sometimes well naturally the mom ordered ice cream for her kids at the end of the meal the little six-year-old boy stared at his ice cream for a moment and then he did something that no one in that restaurant that day will ever forget. He picked up his Sunday and without a word walked over and placed it in front of the woman at the next table. And with a big smile, he said to her, here, this is for you. Ice cream is good for the soul sometimes and my soul is good already. The people in the restaurant applauded. They applauded. And somewhere in heaven, Jesus was smiling because that little boy had already learned how to look at others with the eyes of love. True sight, anointed sight, is always a matter of the heart, not just the eyes. We see with our hearts. Finally, it changes the way we see God. It changes the way we see God. There, there's something fascinating here in the ninth chapter of John. Don't miss it. Notice the way he healed, uh, how the way the healed man refers to Jesus. This is pretty cool if you've never noticed it before. Notice the growth of this young man. There's this magnificent progression as he sees more and more clearly. Look at this. First, he refers to Jesus as a man. He said, the man Jesus did this for me. Next, he, said, he calls Jesus a prophet. He says to the Pharisees, to be able to do this, he must be a prophet. So man, prophet. Then in that intimate moment at the end, he sees Jesus as the Son of God, Christ the Anointed One. And then finally, he claims Jesus as Lord of his life. One, two, three, four, five. The closer he gets to Jesus, the more time he spends with Jesus, the clearer he sees God. And that's the way it works for you and for me, too. Because, you see, that's what it means to have anointed eyes. And so my prayer for you, my prayer for me, is that as we continue our journey with Jesus this Lent to the cross, that we will see ourselves, others, and the Lord with anointed eyes. Amen.
Please stand for the liturgy. between Justice might guide them. God, have mercy on us in love. For all those who labor in service to others, God, have mercy on us in love. Grant whether that nourishes all of creation. Keep watch on our loved ones and keep us from danger. God, have mercy on us in love. For all the beloved who rest in your mercy. God, have mercy on us in love. Help us, comfort us all of our days. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And we pray together as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We shall invite you to come forward for communion tonight. Uh, We'll dispense the little chalices with the wafer at the top and the grape juice at the bottom. Um, you can either remain here, standing or kneeling at the altar rail, or you can take these back to the pew and commune yourselves there. But whenever you receive these elements, know that this is indeed the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. I think to make it easy, why don't we commune this side first, 
okay, the lectern side. After they've all come forward, then the pulpit side. Thank you. Please rise for the blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us bless our God. Praise and thanks to you. May God, Creator, bless us and keep us. 
May Christ be ever light for our lives. May the spirit of love be our guide and path for all of our days. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to be to God.